Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining and being a, a little mm -hmm. early or right on time. I uh, appreciate it. Um, let's give it another minute or two. I like to wait for more people to show up before we begin. And usually people are a little late. So let's just pause for another couple of minutes. Thanks. I don't know if bike bike is happening this year. I'm not sure. I would assume canceled or rescheduled. Anybody know? It'd be really cool to see a virtual. Okay. Yeah. Thanks again for everyone joining on time. I'm expecting at least another handful or so participants to join. So let's give it one more minute um, before we begin. Thanks for your patience and for being on time. We're still gonna end at two, so no worries on that. seen a couple more join um just do me a favor as well as i think as we all know um with this new world of zoom um if you're not speaking and i didn't put the restrictions on just go ahead and mute yourself just to make sure we don't have any background noise when folks are talking or are distracted um so thank you for for doing that ahead of time and we'll get started in about 30 seconds or so All right, I don't see anybody else joining at this point and uh, they're just gonna be a little late, that's the case. So let's get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, this has been uh, a meeting that's been uh, in progress for a couple of months um, after being in touch with many of you, getting this started. Um, so really appreciate you being patient, um, waiting for this and still being interested and in, in involved in, in shaping it. So really appreciate that. Um, just to start, let me get my notes up here. Um, I'm Jared Sanchez, if you don't know me. Um, I am a senior policy advocate at the California Bicycle Coalition, also known as Cal Bike. Um, and I've been here for several years um, and have been involved a little bit here and there around community bike shops or bike kitchens or um, whatever you want to call them. Um, and I'm really excited um, that you all are here. I appreciate that there's enough interest for folks um, to kind of uplift and continue to think and work on these issues. Um, and I appreciate, of course, all the different shops across the state and of course, across the world. Um, just mentioned a bike bike there um, in terms of um, really having a resource for um, different populations um, who either don't have the means or access um, to either paying for services um, and also creating wonderful community spaces in many different parts of the state, um, which is what I see community bikes um, bringing to fruition. So I thank you all for joining and being involved in creating that. Um, I would love to talk more after this um, on different levels around how Cal Bike can be helpful, um, how the, the state of California can be helpful, 
Um, and of course, you know, any way that um, we can uplift the work that you're all doing and all the expertise you bring. So I really appreciate that. Um, let's start off with a review of the agenda really quick. Um, I see a few folks in there. Um, if you can, it'd be helpful to have it open on your screen because I added a couple of links at the bottom, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but again, so this conversation, um, which really is just a conversation, is scheduled for um, two hours. Um, we're going to start off um, just with a quick welcome, which I'm uh, beginning right now. Um, after that, we'll do very short introductions um, of everyone on the call. Um, it'll be very brief, just um, name, where you're at, what shop you're working at or associated with. Um, uh, from there, we'll jump into the, the first meaty part of the conversation, which is around funding opportunities um, for uh, bike shops uh, during COVID and beyond. Um, in a great way, Lori Waters um, from the California Transportation Commission is on and will be presenting um, on that topic. Um, there'll be some Q&A around that. Um, that I would love to have some just general conversation um, and questions from folks, um, really a free for all for all of us here to learn from each other um, and to also share um, the knowledge that we all have around funding um, or lack thereof. Um, after that, um, which Lori needs to depart, um, and we're gonna move on to um, the COVID pandemic and the impact um, on community bike shops. Um, this is coming from uh, a lot of federal, state, and local guidance um, on um, participating or opening up safely, um, operating safely during this time at Community Bike Shops, a very hands-on um, space to be involved in. Um, and um, I would love to go over some few key documents um, through my research um, that I found, but then I would also love to hear from you all doing the work, um, being involved in some of the best practices you have um, and sharing it with others. Um, unfortunately, I tried very hard to get California uh, Public Health Department, various um, local public health departments, um, and um, even some epidemiologists themselves, and um, nobody was able to confirm with me. So um, we're gonna um, move on through the way um, that I designed here, but um, I certainly have been talking with different folks. So if there's any outstanding questions that I can't answer or that we can't answer ourselves, um, I can certainly find um, the right contacts that we can go to to get more specific answers on that. So um, just wanted to sum that up. Um, and then I left uh, just 15 minutes for just open discussion, whether we want to talk about uh, more funding or more um, operations uh, during the pandemic or just generally um, around community bike shops around California. I've heard from several of you that there really isn't a space in California for community bike shops to converse with each other, um, organize, think, um, and really coordinate. Um, so I just wanted to open that up and see if there's any other open discussion we might have. Um, and in the end, just a quick conclusion to, to wrap up. Um, I just wanna note one thing I added to the agenda just now on the second page of the agenda are some important links I'll be sharing and talking about um, some documents um, in the second half of this conversation. So go ahead and look at the agenda to click on those links um, to open them on your computer. I'll most likely um, uh, put them in the chat box over here as well um, in Zoom, um, just to make sure we're all on the same page. And I'll be referring to these specific documents and talking through them through that stage. So it'll be important that you, um, if you want, um, to look along as well and explore those while we're talking. So again, that's on the second page of the agenda, um, those important links. So um, Let's go ahead and get started. Um, well, first let me ask, um, maybe just some head nods and feel free to use the hand raise tool in Zoom. Is that agenda sound good for everyone for the next um, two hours or so? Great, that thumbs up sign is good too, perfect. Great, and Steve, I see your hand raised. Is that a question or, okay, great, this means good. All right, um, all right, let's move forward with introductions. I think the best way to do this, uh, rather than just calling on people, I like going across scanning the state, maybe just from south to north where you're located, all call out counties or regions, and then um, there might be several from the same area, just, you know, be kind to one another and uh, just, you know, uh, try to speak over folks and just, um, I'm looking just for, you know, your name, um, your association with a community bike shop um, or not, um, or some other agency. Um, and um, I think that'd be good for now, just to keep it, it, it down um, to time. So 
let's go ahead and start. Um, let's start from the south. Um, do we have anybody from San Diego County on the call? All right, I, I thought there was someone to be joining, but maybe they'll join soon. Um, how about just north in Orange County? Anybody from Orange County? All right, I should have started more broad. Let's go with LA County. I know there's gotta be a few in LA County. Hey, <clears throat> hi, my name is Danny. I'm with Healthy Active Streets and we're based out of Long Beach, but we do regional work throughout Southern California. Hi, I'm I'm a uh, Dave Poyer. Everybody calls me Poy, and uh, I'm associated with Microwave, which is in the west side of Los Angeles County, uh, in Los Angeles proper. Uh, I'm on the board of directors and have been a volunteer at that shop for six years. I'm Jane, also with Microwave, um, also on the board along with Poy and. Rachel Horn, who's here as well. Hey, I'm Rachel, I'm also on the board, also part of Biker Wave, been involved for about seven years at that shop. Rachel, you have no video. Thank you, yeah. Um, my name is Peter Choi from Bicycle Kitchen uh, in LA. Um, we're located on the eastern side, sort of, East Hollywood. Uh, I'm a board there. Um, I also have another cook from there um, named Gabriel, but he can't really participate. Uh, he's only listening in because he's at work right now. So, um, yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you. Anybody else from LA County? All right, um, let's move um, just east, the uh, Inland Valley or uh, Inland Empire out in Riverside or uh, San Bernardino counties. All right, um, let's go up um, the uh, central coast, maybe uh, Ventura area. Hi, I'm Zuli um, from the Bike Hub in Ventura. Um, yes, good to be here, excited. Well, I don't think your microphone's working, Joey, but uh, is that just me? Is it okay, uh, this is Joey, also from Bike Ventura, sorry. No problem, thank you. Um, how about us, uh, Santa Barbara? I'm from Santa Barbara. Sure, I'm Heather Deutsch. I'm the, can you hear me? I'm Heather Deutsch, the new executive director for the Santa Barbara Bicycle Coalition, and we represent um, three, well, two real bike shops, BC Centro in Santa Barbara and Santa Maria, and sort of a bike shed at the Santa Barbara City College. And I have some of our uh, shop uh, managers are gonna be in and out listening. Great. Um, how about anybody else um, along the, the Central Coast up to, let's say, Santa Cruz area? Do you have anybody on the line? So, uh, Jared, uh, Rick Ellison, uh, executive director of Bike Slow County, and uh, Gary is hitting his mute button. Um, Gary Havis, uh, uh, board president, Bike Slow County. We have the bike kitchen in downtown San Luis Obispo. Wonderful, thank you. Um, let's move inland. Do we have anybody from the Central Valley, anywhere from Kern to Stockton? Hey guys, uh, my name's Asha. I'm with Bike Bakersfield in beautiful downtown Bakersfield. Nice to meet you all. Great. Um, let's, 
I think that's it from the Central Valley. Let's go to um, the Bay Area, maybe starting off on South Bay, San Jose area. Hi, I'm Andrew Yi. I'm from the Silicon Valley Bicycle Exchange. We are in Palo Alto and we serve Santa Clara and San Mateo counties. Happy to be here. And hey everyone, this is Steve. I'm from the San Jose Bike Clinic in downtown San Jose. Great. How about anybody from uh, Alameda, Contra Costa, San Francisco counties? Hey everyone. Sorry, one second. This is Benji from the bikery along with my coworkers, Andrea, Taj, and Ken. And we're all listening in from Oakland, California at the bikery. Hello. Um, this is Diana from Bytopia Community Workshop. We're based in Berkeley, you know, just sort of the general Bay Area. And I'm the only volunteer joining today. Great, thank you. Anybody else from the Bay Area? You need the onion paper flavored ones, okay. right? And remember to just go ahead and mute yourselves if you're uh, not talking at this time so we don't pick up any background noise or embarrassing stories or anything like that. So appreciate it. Um, how about uh, Sacramento area? Have anybody from Sacramento? I'm Howard from the uh, Sacramento Bicycle Kitchen. I'm Aaron. Uh -huh. I'm wearing a West Sac shirt, but I live in Davis and I volunteer at the Davis Bike Collective. My name is Robert I'm with the Sacramento Bike Kitchen. Great. Um, and uh, I hate to do this, but uh, everybody north of Sacramento, north of the Bay, it's a big area, but lesser populated. Do we have anybody from Northern California here? All right, um, and then anybody I missed or who joined late, um, you wanna go ahead and just introduce who you are and where you're associated? I came in a bit late. I'm with uh, Rick and Gary. I manage the bike kitchen in San Luis Obispo. I'm Dan, hello. Hi, I'm Sylvie. I'm with the San Diego County Bicycle Coalition, but I'm also with Bike Stop Pueblo in San Diego. Great, is that it for everyone? Good, um, thank you for everyone um, introducing themselves. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just super excited to see everyone here and uh, know that such a, a good presence across the state um, where you all are working. Um, I forgot to mention um, Dave Snyder, um, the executive director for Cal Bike is also on. So Dave, you wanna give a welcome as well? Yeah, I just wanted to welcome everybody and uh, express my gratitude for all the work that you do in your communities. Uh, one of the reasons why we, we support uh, community bike shops or are doing this to try to help <clears throat> is, is that um, we think that the, the kind of principle that public health has about food deserts ought to apply to bike shops. In, in, in public health and, and economic justice work, there's uh, knowledge that a lot of neighborhoods don't have uh, good uh, grocery stores, good places where you can get healthy food. You, there's only uh, corner stores and unhealthy food. Uh, and, and those food deserts that need to, to be fixed, uh, the same uh, similar idea ought to apply to bike shops. Every neighborhood needs a bike shop. If your bike is broken, you, you can't ride it uh, to go get it fixed. So uh, you all serve a, a lot of uh, bike shop deserts and 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 I uh, pass along my gratitude to you for that and and I hope this is is helpful for you. Yes, did all to all that. I definitely hope this is helpful for you all. Um, and then definitely, yeah, look forward to future conversations as well, which I'm sure we'll get into later. Um, let me just set out a little background first before we get it into the presentation um, from Lori Waters from the CTC around funding. Um, as most of you know, um, a lot of this, um, this conversation was sparked um, by the COVID-19 pandemic um, early on in March, at least here in the US. Um, uh, due to that, as we saw, 
the bicycle kind of, I guess, reemerged or emerged again as being, uh, as a vehicle kind of best suited um, to getting around the area uh, as folks are, uh, were avoiding transit um, um, or other enclosed spaces such as cars um, or car share. Um, bicycles really um, hit a boom again. Um, and I think that's still true um, today. Um, and from that, um, that conversation and just what um, people were doing on the ground, Cal Bike um, thought we'd be um, help facilitate that. So um, a big part of what we did, which is uh, um, wrote, um, Laura McCanny, uh, who is a consultant with CalBike, um, really a close associate with CalBike, um, led up a study slash article um, interviewing several different um, bike shops um, and then uh, volunteers and workers from those shops um, to see how they're working through the pandemic and um, around uh, issues of COVID um, or around funding or around challenges and also just lifting up some of the great things you all do as well. So I hope you had a chance to read that article. It came out, I think in March or April. Um, and there's a few of you on the call that were helped greatly um, um, being interviewees and you know shedding light on all the work you're doing there. Um, so out of that article were a few kind of next steps that uh, we gave ourselves. Um, the three top ones were around awareness, um, government support, um, specifically around best practices uh, for operating during COVID, um, and then any funding opportunities um, that would be helpful um, for the various kind of smaller bike kitchens and bike shops. Um, so the next step was to really facilitate a conversation among you all, and that's where we are today on this, um, kind of lifting up the awareness, which we've been doing through our Cal Bike Report and other channels, um, and then having conversation again around um, best practices um, for COVID and then funding. So. Um, I had been communicating with a few uh, key interviewees in San Jose, LA, Ventura, Santa Barbara, San Francisco, San Diego to really form this conversation and see what would be most helpful. Um, and that's um, where we are. Um, I just want to note real quick, and I'm sure I'll say this later, um, I'm just a facilitator um, for this conversation. Um, I'm certainly not an expert on a lot of the topics we'll be discussing. Um, so um, I really would love to hear um, a really participatory conversation among you all um, around navigating during these times, whether it's funding or best practices or, you know, whatever else comes up through this conversation. So I just wanted to, to make note there um, that I'm certainly not an expert on any of these issues um, and love just to have a, a general conversation about it. So with that, um, let's go ahead and start um, with uh, part two uh, or three of the agenda here and around the funding opportunities. And to do that, we'll start with Lori Waters from the uh, California Transportation Commission. Go ahead, Lori. Okay, thank you, Jared. So my name is Lori Waters and I am the program manager for the active transportation program at the California Transportation Commission. Um, so the California Transportation Commission is not the same as Caltrans. We're a different agency, but we work very closely with Caltrans on this program. So I'm located in Sacramento and actually um, Beverly Newman Burkhardt, she's gonna take herself off video for just a second. She also works on the program. So just so you have another face. Um, <laughs> hi Beverly. Um, so anyway, I'm just kind of surprised because I actually recognize some of your names. Um, so that's good. And you, you might be wondering why I would be on this agenda. And um, first of all, I really want to um, thank Jared for including us because we work a lot. We work a lot with Dave and Jared, and that's great. We work a lot with other state level organizations. However, I think we would like to work more um, at more local and regional and community levels too. So what I wanted to do today is I have a brief PowerPoint that's about the program, just so you know what it, what it is. But then I just wanted to talk to you more about where, how you could be involved, what opportunities that there are for you to be involved, and, um, and then answer any questions. And so um, 
we don't provide funding directly to bike shops, but as you know, the facilities and the programs have to be there for people to ride their bikes. And I think that our program is probably the main funding source for active transportation projects in the state. And it's just gonna be more and more important because I don't think what's happening now with people working at home and, um, um, and the current situation, I don't think we're ever gonna go back to the way things are. And I know I ride my bike a lot more now and I think that's gonna be the case for everyone. So, um, so that's my introduction. So I'm gonna go over the um, PowerPoint and um, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Okay, did I do it, Jared? Yep, looks good, Lori. Okay. Okay. So we are um, in what the fifth cycle of our funding, we call it the 2021 Active Transportation Program. And I'm going to go through these fast and then we, uh, Jared can send them out. If, um, but I just wanted to be very brief on this overview. These are the goals by statute of the program. Increase walking and biking, increase safety, help regional agencies meet their SB 375 goals, enhance public health, ensure disadvantaged communities fully share in the benefits of the program, and provide a broad spectrum of projects. Okay, the, the program is a competitive funding program, and that means that agencies and other entities, and I'll get to that who can apply in a, in a minute here, they submit applications to the program at, at the beginning of each cycle, and then those are evaluated by um, evaluators and given a score, and then we fund the highest scoring project um, up to the level of funding that we have. And it's broken down into three different funding components, which um, I, I'm not going to go into too much. If anybody wants to ask me about that, they can. And then the one statutory requirement we have in terms of where the funding has to go is that a minimum of 25% of the funds in all of the three components must benefit disadvantaged communities. Okay, and these are the eligible applicants. Unlike a lot of other funding programs, we have a lot of eligible applicants. Any local, regional, or state agency can apply. That means any city, county, um, health department, school district, they are all eligible applicants. Caltrans can apply, transit agencies can apply. A transit agency might apply if they were um, wanting a safe rest to transit project. A natural resource or public land agency can apply because they might own a facility that they want to do a uh, project on. Public schools or school districts, tribal governments, and private nonprofits can apply only for the recreational trail funding. We, a small portion of the funds are um, specifically for recreational trails and private nonprofits can uh, apply for those. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, eligible applicants, we fund infrastructure projects. That is anything from bike networks um, to sidewalks, uh, intersection improvements, anything that's infrastructure. We do fund plans. Plans need to be benefit a disadvantaged community. Those are active transportation plans, but they could be more specifically a bike plan or a pedestrian plan or a, uh, just a general active transportation plan. And then we also fund non-infrastructure projects. Those are programs that educate um, people, different kinds of people on how to use facilities. A lot of them are safe routes to school uh, programs, but they can be different kinds of programs. We've, we've funded safe routes to seniors, pro programs, things like that. They're education uh, programs. And then we fund projects that are a combination of both, infrastructure projects with non-infrastructure components. 
Okay, they are broken down into various types. We, uh, from large, medium, and small infrastructure, and then non-infrastructure and plans. Every cycle, we have about 450 million available. Each cycle, that's every two years. And then, um, and we do, every two years, we do a new four-year cycle. So the last two years overlap with the first two years of the, of the next cycle. So far, we've programmed over 800 projects. Most of those do provide uh, benefits to disadvantaged communities. We, so far, we have a very good delivery rate. And all of the projects from the first cycle are either complete or under construction. So this is just very brief on some of the program challenges. The program is very oversubscribed. We we only last cycle we were only able to fund about a quarter of the ask that we got in, which is actually even less than our first cycles. The funding requests are getting larger. This is a challenge and an opportunity. The good thing about it is, is that means we're getting uh, more projects that can have more of a transformative benefit on a community. The downside to it is because they, um, they're so much larger in terms of funding requests, the funds don't spread around as much. The program funds all project phases. That this probably doesn't mean a lot to you, but it's because we fund from the start of a project to uh, meaning the environmental phase all the way to construction. And uh, a big challenge we've had that we've been working on is how do we measure the performance of the program? This gets asked a lot by legislators and we need to be able to answer that question so we can continue getting the funding and it helps people like Dave and Jared try to get us more money, money for the program. Um, we also have an Active Transportation Resource Center. This is run by Caltrans, but the program provides funding to it, and it provides resources and technical assistance um, to partners across California. We have a mailing list, and then uh, various kinds of trains and things like that. It's, it, it's a very helpful resource. And then these are the commission staff who works on the program, me, Alika Changizi, and then Beverly Newman Burkhart. So that's a very brief overview um, of the program. So um, I would, so right now, I just wanted to briefly tell you how Community members and bike shop owners like you can get involved, and it's really important because you know best what your community needs. So the ways that you can be involved are with your local agency. Make sure that they are applying for the projects that the community wants and needs and help them plan that project. And then also you can get involved at the state level. You can be part of uh, the process as we develop the program every cycle, meaning that you can be involved in the guidelines process, either directly, anybody can be involved in our process. You can attend workshops or you can um, get information through Jared and Dave. That's another way too. But uh, even though we are a state agency, these projects are so community driven and so community focused. It's really important that all of you are involved and that we're not just hearing from other agency people all the time, because I'll tell you that's who is mostly involved. And like I said, I think some of you actually, I have either met or you attended a workshop or something in the past. Um, the other thing is that we use volunteer evaluators when we evaluate the projects. This is probably very different from other grant programs. The reason that we do that is because we get so many applications. Uh, we need a lot of people to help us get through them, but also because we feel like the ATP is, um, it's not our program, it's all of our program. So we like to have as many people that care about it as involved as they can be. 
So we already have our evaluators for this cycle, although Beverly always likes getting more um, alternates just to make her feel better to know we have plenty of people there for evaluating. And, um, but then uh, keep in mind about this for next cycle too, that we always need people to evaluate. Um, and it's, it's a really good way to learn about the different kinds of active transportation projects that are going on in the state. And it, it just helps us a lot. So, sorry, that's my dog. Um, um, so I want to stop now because I really want to hear from you to hear, see if you have questions for me. And then I also wanted to uh, make sure that I told you that I sent to Jared a um, kind of a nice, it's a nice table of all of the funding opportunities for active transportation projects in the state. I think it's a very useful way for everyone to know uh, the different funding sources that are out there. So Jared, is that, is that okay if I stop now and just take questions or whatever, whatever you want? Definitely. Um, and before we do that, I just want to pull up, I just shared my screen. Hopefully you all can see it. Um, I just shared my screen for the document that Lori shared with me in terms of um, different funding programs across the state um, and um, how they may um, apply to bike elements. Um, and there's a variety of programs here that I'm familiar with. Um, some of you also might be familiar with. Um, a big one here is the Office and Traffic Safety Grant Program. Um, but there's other programs um, that can fund um, uh, bikes um, and bike elements. And I'm going to put, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to put the link um, in the chat box for you to check that out. Um, and thank you very much, Lori, for your presentation. Um, let's go ahead and start off with just any questions that folks may have for Lori. Um, and then after we um, go through all the questions, if there's no longer, um, I kind of want to just open it up um, for kind of general discussion around funding. So first questions for Lori, and you know it'd be helpful is to raise your, use the raise your hand tool, um, and I can develop a queue over here and uh, go ahead and, and um, do that way. So um, I see a first couple hands. Let's first um, go with um, Poi. You want to go? Yeah, uh, Lori, a uh, biker wave is organized a little bit. It's not exactly a public non, uh, a private nonprofit. Uh, we are organized as a not-for-profit business. So it's at, at some point somewhere buried in the paperwork, even though we operate as a nonprofit and get donations without giving tax receipts, um, we are not a nonprofit uh, classically. So I know I have two other members of the board on with me. So just for the self-interest of our, our particular bike co-op, uh, is there anything that we would be eligible to, well, eligible for? So this is what I would say. I think that you can partner with somebody who's eligible. I think that would be the best way for you because I'm, I'm going to be totally honest about something. Even though nonprofits are eligible for those rec trails funding, the problem is anyone that gets funded has to um, be able to enter into a master agreement with Caltrans. And the few nonprofits that have been successful have not been able to get those master agreements. It's really, really difficult. So okay. um, I would say in, that you're, um, a better way for, is for you to partner with somebody who already has the master agreement with Caltrans. So that would be a city or um, school district or a, a health department, something like that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm complete. Great, any other questions? Dina, I thought I saw your hand up. Do you have a question still? Okay, Danny. So, um, Larry, my question was, uh, I saw that uh, nonprofits can apply for trails, but that's very limited because there are zero trails near Long Beach and LA. Um, why is that? Why is it only applicable to trails? I was wondering if you knew why. So I think it might be in legislation, but it's also because of um, 
it has to be generally our applicants are 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 is an agency that owns the facility or like in the case of like a school district they would be applying for a program so um that's why that's that's the limits of the eligible applicant does that make sense I'm not sure if i answered that right no i don't think you answered the question actually so okay why why would nonprofits be applicable only for trails why can't they just be applicable for something within a city so it's only for trails because that is in legislation that's i know that so and there's there is this um rec recreational trails uh pot of funding which i can't remember how much of our um how much it is i don't know beverly if you you probably don't remember either it's not very much it's only a couple million um, and it's split between our program and parks. They also have a recreational trail program, but that that is it's a specific funding source that has that in their legislation, private nonprofits are um, eligible. That that sounds similar to like a case we have here in Long Beach. Um, we have the Port of LA, but the Port of Long Beach can only um, support the Cerritos wetlands with its um what are they called the funds that they want to like help the environment or whatever the cerritos wetlands is located opposite to long beach it's actually closer to orange county than it is to la county but um jared it sounds like an opportunity for us to like look at that legislation thanks really great thanks danny um i see a hand raise gary you want to go next I think he, yes, now I can finally make the phone do what I want it to do. Uh, <laughs> Gary Hathis, Pikesville County, San Luis Obispo. Uh, on behalf of another organization that I am friendly with and love playing around with because they do such good work is the Central Coast Concerned Mountain Biking Group. Um, and they do trails in our local open spaces and when the state parks are open, they do trails in the state parks. Uh, is there anything I can pass along to them and their group because they're doing mountain biking trails and cooperating with hikers and equestrians? Anything I can pass along to them uh, from this uh, from this discussion? Um, yeah. So what I'll tell you is that um, this is probably the number one point I can tell you with projects like that. The the program is extremely competitive, as I said. So while um, projects that are recreational focused can compete, the more that you can show that a project is um, serving a diverse function, the better it's gonna do. Meaning if, um, if not only is it a recreational trail, it's also going to get people somewhere that they need to go. Um, that that will make it much much more successful. Does that, Jared? Do you have anything else that you can add to that? No, I, th I think that's good. Thank you. Um, yeah, and like I said, I think so. We, I know some of the bike coalitions work with local agencies on their projects. And the more that, that, that you can do that, the better projects that you'll see. The projects that you want, not, not the projects that somebody else thinks that you want. Great, thank you. Um, Joey, I see your hand raised. You wanna go next, Joey? Uh, sure. Is everyone able to hear me? Yeah. Um, thanks, Lori, for your presentation. So looking at some of these applications and, and having some experience with them, they're all pretty um, cumbersome uh, to begin with. And a lot of these bike shops, uh, community bike shops are like small and maybe don't have the capacity to fill out something like an ATP. I mean, maybe supporting them. But I noticed a lot of like the non-infrastructure and like encouragement programs. I think encouragement's probably the closest thing yeah. that you would file, I guess, a community bike shop under. 
-hmm. but most, I think the traditional, what's seen as like an encourage program, encouragement program is like a lot of youth programming, mm -hmm. um, which is great, but what can we do to like really get community bike shops included and recognized as a really important part of the encouragement aspect of some of these grants? Because I think that some, you know, it's not something that many people really know about or realize is being so vital uh, to, at the at very least encouraging, I think is kind of a, a weak word for it, but promoting that uh, active transportation. So I think what, and Jared kind of mentioned this to me, and now, now I think I'm understanding it better now too. So, so is, it, is it possible that bike shops actually could do non-infrastructure programs? Is that, that's what I'm hearing, right? Okay. Well, um, yeah. A community bike shop in itself like is an encouraged program outside of the traditional like bike shop, I think. Right. Okay. And just to be, just to clarify a little bit, Lori, um, yeah, definitely different than just your standard retail shop. It's more of like a hands-on, teach folks how to work on their bikes and then very much more community driven. So that's the general okay. context of folks. Okay, so, so now to do that, if, if a community bike group was to be an applicant, I think that would require legislation change, I think because I don't think you would be up, you could apply on your own. You could apply jointly with maybe a um, health department or a school district or something like that. Um, so that would be the first thing. Um, and then I think we would have to look at um, probably our guidelines and just to make sure that there aren't other obstacles. But th th this is actually a very interesting um, issue that I hadn't thought about. And I'm, I probably need Jared's help on that to see if, if we could um, broaden that eligibility for um, non-infrastructure projects. And um, to address your first part about the, the application process, it, it, is, it is a difficult application. It's, but particularly it is for large infrastructure projects. The, the non-infrastructure application is um, stream. So before it used to be everybody filled out the same application and it was very difficult for uh, non-infrastructure projects and plans to fill out the application because it was more suited to infrastructure. Now we have an application that is specifically for non-infrastructure and specifically for plans. And we're always working on those to um, streamline them if we can. So that is another way that you could be involved to help us um, if, if we need to keep working on those applications to make them accessible to anyone. Hey, thank you, Lori. Yeah, that's a question I was gonna ask as well. And um, yeah, I think there's further work needed there to, to make it more accessible. Because um, yeah, this is a specific subgroup of the bike community that, yeah, traditionally either doesn't have the resources or access to a lot of state funding. So um, it's a difficult question. And um, yeah, moving a lot, millions of dollars is a, is a very cumbersome process. So um, trying yeah. to figure it out is gonna be difficult. <laughs> But, what if, but Jared, I, I do think it's something that we could explore a little bit more and see what, see if there's more we can do. And one of, um, I didn't mention this, but this cycle, we're trying a uh, pilot program for quick builds. Um, and, and we're doing that and it's, uh, we'll see how it goes. And uh, we're learning a lot. We'll, we're going to be releasing our recommendations for those soon. But I think there's interest in us doing other kinds of pilots too. It helps us if there's something that we want to try out, um, but there's a lot of questions that we still have. If we can do it as a pilot, that helps because then we, we, we don't get in too deep right away just in case there's things that we can't figure out. So if that's another thing, if there's, if there's a, some kind of a pilot that we could do, um, we can think about that too for next cycle. 
Good idea. Thanks, Lori. Um, I see a couple more hands raised here. So the next one I saw was Stanley. Stanley, you ready for your question? I'm, I'm Lindell Price. I'm watching with my yeah. husband, Stanley <laughs> Price. And um, a few years back, I was an evaluator on the active, for the active transportation program. And a question I have is about eligibility of facilities that are closed um, at night, for example. And at that time, there were applications that were closed at night or had limited hours that wouldn't really serve particularly people from disadvantaged communities. And I'm wondering if that's been adjusted. to consider that the facility function as a transportation facility, that it's a 24 hour all weather type facility. So I'm not sure I totally understand the question. Is it, um, uh, I don't think I understand. Jared, can you help me? Sorry, oh. I was preoccupied. You just wanna kind of restate it? Okay, I'm, I'm wondering for, App, active transportation program uh, facilities, is there an expectation if they're being, if the application is putting them forward as a transportation facility versus a strictly recreational facility, that they be a 24 hour all weather type facility, at least comparable to our roads, so that people, particularly people in disadvantaged communities who don't have other options, if they're relying on say bicycling to and from work, that it be available to them? I don't know if we, I have to look to see if we ask specifically about that, but um, if, that, if that's something that needs to be addressed, we could um, make sure that that's, that we think about that for the guidelines and then and the application for uh, next cycle. Great. Um, I see one more hand raised. Um, Asha, do you want to go next? Did you ask? Yep, thanks. Um, I was also, sorry, I have a little background. I was, I was also an evaluator a couple years ago with the ATP program. And one thing I noticed is the, um, the scoring rubric for the non-infrastructure programs. It seemed really hard for um, education and encouragement programs um, unless they had some sort of public agency backing, it seemed hard for them to score high enough to even be funded. Um, so I wanted to know if, um, I haven't specifically looked at this year's, this cycle's scoring rubric, but I wanted to know if there were changes to kind of um, allow more flexibility in what scores high. Because for us, like leading education and encouragement programs will indirectly, you know, decrease the vehicle miles traveled, but it's hard to quantify that, you know, in an, a smart cycling class or a community led ride through a neighborhood specifically. Um, and also a, a second question I have is, are, is would there be a benefit in combining the planning and non-infrastructure applications? Because I think having the non-infrastructure projects brings more community residents into the world of active transportation and could improve on the plans being developed. So Asha, what, what cycle did you uh, evaluate? I believe it was cycle three or four. I can't remember. It was a 2017, 2016. Okay, that was cycle three. So okay. um, yeah, so like I mentioned, since, since then in, in the last cycle, cycle four in this cycle, we broke out the uh, non-infrastructure and plans as their own specific applications with their own specific scoring rubrics. So my short answer to that is yes, we, we have addressed that to the extent that we could right now. And we did notice last cycle, non-infrastructure and plans were more successful. Uh, so I think that helped. Um, we, and I think that we need to continue working on particularly the non-infrastructure application and 
the scoring rubrics to make sure that we're getting those right. But, uh, but yeah, but that, you are correct. That was uh, an issue uh, before the last cycle. And then I knew this was gonna happen. I forgot your other question. It was about um, getting pairing non-infrastructure programs with planning programs to get better resident feedback. Okay, so right now, plans and non-infrastructure cannot be combined. Um, and there's a reason why, but uh, I will be totally honest, I don't remember right now. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. It, it could be, I don't know if that's in legislation or if there's another reason. It, it might be because it's uh, the way that they are delivered. I think it might be difficult to combine those two, but, um, but I, have to get, I have to get a better answer on that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ashwin. Great. So Lori is only with us for another five minutes. Is there any other um, questions specifically for, for Lori or her presentation? Okay, good. Um, and then you saw Lori's contact information. Um, go ahead and yeah, email her directly. I'm sure she would be very responsive as she is to me always um, to any questions you may have further. Um, with the remaining time, and we don't have a lot of time before we move on to um, the COVID-19 discussion, um, but I, um, in a few conversations I've had with a few of you, um, either as a group or individually, um, I, um, yes, <laughs> Thank you, Lori, for, for all of the, joining us and, and with all of that. And feel free to leave. I know you have to leave in a couple of minutes, so um, feel free just to jump off. But thank you, and I'll be following up. Um, uh, as far as other funding opportunities, um, and I shared that PDF, that sheet of um, things um, that are applicable. Um, some of them are really far out of reach. Like, you really need to be dialed into some of these programs and be, paid, be a paid advocate like myself to really get involved to understand some of the details of that. Um, and that's something I can further do if folks are interested. But what I'm interested in, uh, maybe we can extend this for the next five or 10 minutes, is hearing from you all about funding opportunities that either you've received or sought after or that you've heard of or had questions on. And there's one thing that came to my mind that was a great example. Um, and Sylvie from San Diego was on earlier and I hope you're still on Sylvie. If not, I can best summarize this, but Sylvie was yeah, talking- Yeah, I'm still on. Great, you were talking about an OTS grant and the process of that. Is it okay to just share very briefly, maybe in a couple of minutes about how that worked out for you, what the process was, and maybe others can kind of chime in as well um, around that if they have any experience with it. Is that okay to put you on the spot right now? Yeah, that's all good. Um, so I actually, when I came to the San Diego County Bicycle Coalition, we uh, had an existing OTS grant. So someone else had made a good partnership with OTS and then through them, the San Diego police. And so we get subcontracted as, you know, a, a legal nonprofit, the Bike Coalition, um, to kind of help fulfill the, the OTS grant that the police get. So. I think, you know, kind of what Lori was talking about is that a lot of how like little nonprofits and even like community bike shops get the funding effectively is by building great partnerships with places like Cal Bike and the San Diego County Bicycle Coalition because what we'll end up doing at the Bike Coalition is we'll then subcontract, you know, places like Bike Self Pueblo, the community bike shop that I'm also at, and we'll ask them to help us fulfill the grant. So thankfully, you know, I think the all of like the heavy lifting of applying to grants, which is so tedious and like also takes some level of skill, can be done by a different organization. And if you can find out who it is that's applying to those and then come in and like, you know, offer something that they can't do. And I think community bike shops usually have a totally different reach than some of the bike coalitions and, you know, local nonprofits that would be getting these grants. That's one of the best ways to go about accessing something like those yes funds. Let me know if you uh, have any questions about that. That was, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty simple on the end of the bike collective just because it's just about finding those people that already have the funding or convincing them to get the funding with you. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And yeah, thank you for, for explaining that, Sylvia. I guess though the other piece that I was curious about that you could share, and you shared with a couple of us already a couple of months ago, was the, the specific like OTS scan from the San Diego Police Department. I think this is a, a key thing to bring up now, especially in terms um, of where we are um, with George Floyd and all of the, the racial justice work going on. Are you able to explain in a couple of minutes about how that process worked with OTS, the police department, and how the, uh, the bike shop was able to get funds for that? Um, yeah, I think I saw, I mean, do you mean in the context of like the challenges now of being allied with the police and the work we do, or do you mean no, just more about what? how that worked and like how you were able to either, I forget what the story was, whether you, uh, yeah, connected with them or yes, yeah, somehow received funding. It was a really great story and maybe I shouldn't have brought it up and put you on the spot, but I don't know if there's something more to, to add. Um, yeah, again, you know, this is the grant that the Bike Coalition got before I was involved in them. So I was just kind of passed down the existing contacts they had. But my sense of it is, you know, we reached out to the uh, the police department and looked at the OTS grant with them. And the police had decided that they wanted to do a lot of outreach and engagement, but they didn't have a way to do that specifically with bicycles. They wanted to focus just on kind of pedestrian traffic safety. So um, some combination of us saying this is what we can offer and them saying this is the gap we have that needs to be filled we were able to come up with a way to like build a program that accomplished the bike side of the you know traffic safety they've been hoping to implement through education so is that what you mean kind of <laughs> yeah exactly and you know what that that's the key point is that and i didn't mention it those familiar with those ots grants I, only specific agencies are eligible to receive those so in this case i think it was the police department that received it i think that's probably the case across the state and in in that example they didn't really have the connections or you know wherewithal or knowledge about how to implement that so um there was you know a variety of community bike shops and the one in san diego was able to connect with them and do that work so this kind of connects to other work that CalBike is working on in terms of, you know, thinking about, you know, diverting funds that should be going directly to community bike shops and not other agencies who, you know, may not know what they're doing in that space. So I think that example that thank you very much, Sylvie, for, for trying to, to lift up after putting you on the spot, I think is a good one. Um, and if others have examples like that or others that are helpful would be great. Just go ahead and raise your hand. Um, and I want to extend this for at least another couple of minutes. I think it's a, a good discussion to have. And luckily, I see Danny with your hand up. So do you want to chime in, Danny? Yeah. yeah um, I initially had a question about the San Diego um, Bicycle Coalition's um, OTS grant, because I facilitated an, an Office of Traffic Safety grant in 2017. And uh, instead of partnering with the Long Beach Police Department, I partnered with the Long Beach Health Department. So you don't necessarily have to go through a police department. The police department, um, after our grant cycle ended, ended up taking over the Office of Traffic Safety grants and applications. And all of that money now is funneled through the Long Beach PD. The Long Beach PD is currently using um, Office of Tra Traffic Safety money to do um, DUI checkpoints. And they also started doing a pedestrian um, safety and like outreach engagement, which I believe is not necessarily what my community needs. We do not need to have additional interactions with armed police officers in, in my community. I don't know about you know the rest of the state, but I don't, uh, I don't advocate and I don't agree that you know, my state dollars should be used to pay p police to interact with people while they're walking down the street. That's just um, how I feel about it. But like I said, Within my city, I know in 27, after 2017, I think it was very difficult to get a bicycle um, education and a uh, bicycle youth education money from the OTS. It's difficult to impossible and we haven't done it since. Thanks for bringing that up, Danny. And yeah, really highlighting some of the, the things I was trying to say. I, th I think that's important. And I, I do think there's like, and I think this is a good example. I think why I wanted to bring it up is that there's different pots of funding at the state level that could fund the work you all are doing, um, but it's currently not not set up that way. Um, and it's going to take a lot of work on Cal Bikes part and other advocates who, you know, have that knowledge and time and money to invest to know those programs and to share it out with others to 
to see what could be made eligible and you know what could be changed. And I will say the last thing is is that as you can see with Lori's presentation, there's a lot of that what she was talking about is very helpful, useful information. But at the community bike level, with not a lot of resources, it's you know quite hard to get access and to to get those resources. And there's not specific pot of funds that the governor or the legislature has authored um, to make specific to community bike shops. So I think on top of just kind of advocating with your local agencies, I think there's a lot of work to do around the state and with state local uh, or state officials and the governor himself is to, you know, advocate for specific funds um, for specific needs that you all need that are, you know, either being ignored or not addressed or just not, you know, be paid attention to. So that's just a general kind of shout out to bringing up advocacy into the, all the great kind of hands-on work that you all do in the community. And I know it's very hard to do both, um, but I hope these conversations kind of make the, I guess, partnership or that coordination a little easier in the future. Um, are there any other questions um, before we move on to the COVID-19 work around funding uh, anything or questions that maybe you want me to pursue that maybe I can follow up on? Just any last words on, on funding before we move on? Joey, I see your hand raised, go ahead. Well, I think Heather from um, the BC Central and Santa Barbara might not be here, but I know that they have access to some of their um, county's um, self-help transportation sales tax funding. And that's something that um, they get a lot of help from as far as like another source of revenue. Absolutely, I think, yeah, that's a really great point. Um, only a third of the funding for transportation uh, comes from the state over 50% comes locally from those sales taxes. So that's exactly a good point. Most of the counties you live in have them and are being tapped by your local agencies. And the last thing I'll say, um, as Lori mentioned, most of the conversations that are being had at the state level are between agencies and CTC staff as Lori or you know certain legislators. So um, there needs to be, yeah, a lot um, uplifted with your local agencies that either they can bring into the conversation or that maybe you or advocates that you know can also bring into the conversation because most of the times it's just um, elected officials, you know, getting stuff they want funded and not so much of, you know, what the actual needs are that you all experience with on a day to day basis. So just to put that out there, kind of like my advocacy hat on as always. So just wanted to point that out. Anything else before I move on? Um, well, th this is this was a one-time thing, but very recently, uh, the bicycle kitchen in LA we applied for the EIDL loan, um, the you know the one that federal government just pretty much gave it to everyone in response to COVID nineteen. Um, it was a large sum, and then there are a lot of well, there aren't that many, but there are some restrictions on how to use it. So we decided to use it exclusive for mortgage payments, which is more than 50% of our um, expense anyway. So that was a pretty good um, loan. It's, it, it was given at 2.75% interest, which was pretty good compared to any other loans out there. Um, so I mean, that was a pretty good opportunity, I thought. Yeah, I think it's a great example to bring up, Peter. Anybody else have experience or questions for Peter on that? All right, let's go ahead and, and move on. Um, thank you everyone for, yeah, sitting around with that and for your questions, I really appreciate it. Um, so now to transition to uh, the second part of the conversation um, around uh, COVID-19, um, the impacts um, on you all, your spaces, and just generally um, around the state, um, again, I was unfortunately able to secure a speaker for this. Um, a lot of them were saying, of course, they were dealing with um, their own issues within their workspaces and environments, and they didn't have a lot of time for this. So completely understandable. Um, so I definitely took time um, to learn a little bit more, and I wanted to share that with you. Um, just a little disclaimer first. I think it's just a safe thing to do that anything I say or Cowbike says is you know, not professional advice. Um, it, I will be quoting, like, official public health documents, which I shared the links to and may share on my screen, which is, I guess, professional medical health advice. Um, but certainly, um, I am not an expert on this. Um, we weren't able to get an expert on this. 
Um, I'll be sharing a video very soon um, that I think consulted experts. Um, so the information will be very important. Um, but again, um, I, I am not an expert myself. Um, and we'll love to hear from you all about how you um, are working on this. So to begin this conversation, I would like to do a presentation. Um, Charles Dandino, I think that's how you pronounce his name. I believe he's um, at the LA Bike Kitchen or somewhere in LA County, um, want, offered to talk about how his employer um, is working through the pandemic and some of the best practices they have. Um, I didn't know his employer was JPL, which is uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, is that what it's called, um, over there in the Pasadena area. And he said um, in the last couple of months, they developed a video, a 14-minute video um, that I looked through and found to be pretty helpful as well. So to start off, I'm going to share my screen um, for the next 14 minutes um, and play this video. Um, along with the audio, um, and I'll be back um, right after that. So just hang tight as I transition there, um, and please let me know if the audio isn't working, but I tested out earlier and it seemed to be fine. So here we go. The health and safety of our employees, contractors, and visitors are of the utmost importance. The COVID-19 impact to society and the mitigation strategies, such as social distancing and shedding prevention, have impacted how work is performed across the country. As a result, this training provides guidance for protecting anyone that requires working indoors, in close contact with others, or sharing common workspaces. We hope to minimize the risk of exposure, illness, and spread of the disease. Thank you in advance for your willingness to adopt the safety measures that are presented in this training. Together, we can break the chain. COVID-19 is caused by a new coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. Coronaviruses are a large family of viruses that are common in people and in many different species of animals. The complete clinical picture of COVID-19 is not fully known. Reported illnesses that range from very mild, including some people with no reported symptoms, to severe, including illness resulting in death. The virus spreads mainly from person to person, between people who are in close contact with one another, through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks. These droplets can land in the mouth or nose of people who are nearby and possibly be inhaled into the lungs. You may also contract the virus by touching a surface or object that has the virus on it and then by touching your mouth, nose, or eyes. In light of how COVID-19 spreads, along with evidence of the widespread COVID-19 illness in communities across the country, you are required to wear a cloth covering to cover your nose and mouth when near other people, working indoors, and sharing a common work area or surface. This is to protect the people around you. You still may be infected, but do not have symptoms. Knowing the pros and cons of different face coverings will help you understand why a face covering is more appropriate for certain circumstances. You may not feel sick, but you could be asymptomatic. No one knows for sure if they are carrying the virus. Wearing the face covering protects others from you, and in return, they are protecting you from them. Face coverings must cover your nose and mouth, you want them to fit snugly, but comfortably against your face. Remember to make sure they are secured with ties, bands, or ear loops. Face covering should include multiple layers of fabric while still allowing for breathing without any restriction. They also should be able to be laundered without damage or losing shape. 
When putting on and taking off your face covering, take care not to touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. Wash or sanitize your hands after handling your mask. Let's work together to ensure that N95 masks and surgical masks are available for healthcare providers working on the front line of defense against the virus. Protective eyewear or face shields should be used only in the short term or when working in close proximity work is unavoidable. Using eyewear will accomplish two things. First, it will reduce the likelihood of drops contacting your face. Second, it will remind people not to touch their face without first washing their hands. Safety eyewear should be washed with soap and water before and after each use. Now that you have a general understanding of COVID-19, how it is spread, and the personal protective equipment used, let's go through a typical workday from sunrise to sunset. If you wake up and you're not feeling well, please stay at home. Anyone with symptoms like fever, cough, or shortness of breath should notify their supervisor immediately. Follow the CDC recommended steps to help you get through your recovery. When you are feeling better, contact your supervisor. They will share HR's return to work process with you. If you are well, but have a sick family member at home with COVID-19, or have been in close contact with someone who is symptomatic, you should immediately notify your supervisor and stay home. Even if you wake up feeling healthy, a good practice is to take your temperature. Perhaps you are concerned about contracting the virus. Maybe you have young children, or you may be caring for someone who is at an increased risk. If you do not feel comfortable for any reason, contact your supervisor to work out a plan. Don't forget to put on your face covering, bring your hand sanitizer, and a paper towel. You should have your face covering on before you arrive at work. When you approach the security guards, make sure to keep your distance. You are now required to scan your badge at the secondary security checkpoints. Be careful not to touch the card reader with your bare hands. After passing the checkpoint and parking your car, it is recommended to carry your paper towel with you as you walk to your workstation. The paper towel will help you avoid touching surfaces with your fingertips. There is an increased risk of transmitting the virus when touching surfaces without a barrier. If you're going to use an elevator, take note only three people are allowed in the cabin at one time. If you witness someone who is not following the Safe at Work protocol, kindly remind them. If the individual continues not to follow the Safe at Work protocol, or you do not feel comfortable approaching them, contact your supervisor and inform them of your concern. Supervisors will talk to the person and ensure that protocols are followed immediately while keeping all sources confidential. When you arrive at your workstation, make sure to disinfect all surfaces and the devices. If you work in an open area, make sure to clean your area frequently. It is important to wash your hands often. Before you leave the bathroom, grab a new paper towel for your next journey.
If you are feeling sick and are at work or were physically on site within 48 hours of your symptoms developing, go home immediately and inform your supervisor. The definition of shedding, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, means to give off discharge or expel from the body. Every single one of us could have COVID-19 without even knowing it. To protect ourselves and others, we must do everything possible to prevent the shedding. Avoid areas that are not in use and avoid using office equipment whenever possible. Cover your mouth and your nose with a tissue if you sneeze or cough and use the inside of your elbow. Avoid sharing equipment whenever possible. And if you do share equipment, disinfect the equipment before and after each use. You must regularly disinfect your own workstation, any shared work areas and equipment. Be sure to wipe down desks, counters, refrigerator doors, microwave controls, doorknobs, shared tools, and shared machinery. The clean room environment offers an extra layer of protection as a result of the ventilation design. Gowning rooms should be used by one person at a time. Air showers also one at a time and change your clean room garments based on your work area procedure. Increased air circulation contributes to reduce risk of exposure to the virus. During this time, it's important to eat lunch at least six feet away from anyone else, preferably much more since face coverings will be removed. Remember, six feet is a minimum distance stay as far as possible from other people, particles can travel up to 26 feet. Clean your area before and after you eat. No one knows where the virus is. People can spread the virus before they ever know that they are sick. Face coverings may provide a false sense of security and it is imperative to maintain social distances. In addition to other safety measures, Avoid crowded areas and mass gatherings. Avoid shaking people's hands. If possible, avoid using any kind of public transportation, ride sharing, or carpooling. If you can, continue to work from home. Protect your family and loved ones. Upon arriving home, Make sure to remove your shoes before going inside. Make your first stop the bathroom, carefully remove your face covering, and wash it in hot, soapy water, or as per the CDC guidelines. To reduce the risk of shedding the virus in your home, it is important to wash the clothes that you wore during the workday. It is also smart practice to take a shower before going into the rest of your home or conversing with other people. Change your clothes and make sure you wash anything that you might have touched on your way into the home. If you or anyone else in your home starts to feel sick at any time, notify your supervisor immediately. Understanding what measures you can take and what is the most effective prevention to the least effective protection will help keep you, your colleagues, and your loved ones safe. Have symptoms? Stay home. Put on a face covering, use hand sanitizer, wash your hands frequently, do not shake hands, stay at least six feet from coworkers, wear safety goggles or glasses, clean your workstation, and don't put yourself or others at risk. If we work from the assumption that we are all potential carriers of this deadly virus, we will protect each other at work, our loved ones, and the world. Break the chain. All right.
thanks for everyone for sitting through that. Um, I felt like it was a, a good summary um, of what I've learned and um, what I've read and what I've heard others say um, around generally um, prevention around the virus. Um, I am going to go through a couple things that I've learned that I wanted to share that I think were particularly useful. Um, I see in the chat box and definitely feel free to use this chat box and share resources as well. And I'd love to hear from you all too about what you're doing. Um, from our article, we learned that many of you are already operating um, safe um, and healthy spaces um, for uh, bikes, uh, mechanics, volunteers, um, others. Um, some have been doing um, curbside um, type operations, and I think there's a variety of other ways of doing it. Um, I think um, generally, yeah, if we learn from each other around this, a lot of the points raised in the video I thought were helpful, um, and a lot of the documents I'll share in a minute are helpful. But a lot of them are, yeah, I think are common sense at this point, kind of six months into the pandemic, we're all been inundated with the variety of different things wherever we're at. Um, so I just wanted to give um, a little more overview of that. And especially since um, there are no official guidance documents that I'm aware of specifically for community bike shops, the closest ones I've seen are retail or auto dealers or other places like that, that you kind of have to adapt to your situation is difficult and that was i was really hoping for to find an expert um, who could speak to the, the bike shop space but given that it's relatively small um I, I don't know if that exists um i think there's some consultants out there that could be helpful and i reached out to one private consultant um that offered to be available in the future um about how um, they could provide guidance um hopefully for free um but um um, we'll see how that goes. But how about for now, um, I'm going to be using the chat box as you all are as well and putting some links um, into here as I go through a couple pieces. Um, I also put the links at the second page of the agenda. So if that's easier for you, um, I'll just be going from the top down um, for um, what I'll be talking about here. And I'll be talking about the federal guidance, um, state guidance, and some local county guidance as well that you all may be familiar with have already seen and i'll go over it kind of quickly because again i think um they all cover the same material um but maybe not um the same way and there may be a few pieces you might learn from it that you were unaware of before as i certainly was when i was going through it so to start off at the federal level um i'm using um the first um link here and it's kind of like a general guidance for um employers and spaces um, and this was um, developed early on into the pandemic, um, and um, there's a variety of pieces talking around the workplace, safe practices, of course, um, about how to um, encourage employees to stay home, and then other health checks and a variety of things that um, this page um, has as resources. Um, what I thought a, a very um, good resource was for kind of reopening. Um, or resuming business or a community bike shop is in this link. Um, and it's through the CDC called um, the Resuming Business uh, Toolkit. And if you've seen this already, there's, um, or if you haven't, um, there's a variety of, of kind of different resources here. There's an employer sheet, um, which kind of puts off like a, a checklist um, if you really want to make sure to, to be, um, uh, thorough um, in your safe and healthy space. There's a checklist here um, that I thought was very useful um, if you're kind of running and organizing a shop. Um, there's infographics on this toolkit and also a, a worker prevention type um, tool as well. Um, and a couple of different infographics that you could use that are helpful that I found were um, great. Um, moving on from the federal down to the state level, when I was talking with the California Department of Health, um, they suggested um, that uh, a few key guidance documents um, would be helpful. Um, and again, since there isn't anything specific for um, bike shops or community bike shops or bike kitchens, um, they suggested um, uh, the retail guidance document might be most appropriate. So I'm linking that into the chat box now. And as you can kind of scroll through this, um, 
and there's a couple others they recommended too that I'm also um, linking. There's an auto dealership, kind of car rental place, and then there's kind of a, um, not kind of, but there's a hair salon and barbershop guidance and document as well that I put in the chat box. And they're all very similar, around 10 to 11 pages. From what I could tell, they covered mostly the same information around physical distancing, of course, face coverings, the hand washing, um, and um, training workers and others um, around a prevention plan. So it goes into some details that you may find useful in your workplace specific sites um, that you may be able to adapt um, that um, the California Department of Public Health recommended to me. And of course, they're using CDC guidelines to guide a lot of the work that they're doing um, as well. Um, to jump from the state down to the local, um, as I was searching for other resources that might be helpful, um, I, kind of, I came across the LA County um, site um, for COVID-19, which I just linked into the chat box and again, also in the agenda. And I felt this was a really helpful um, web page um, because they have sp specific appendices for a, a variety of different industries. Um, but then if you scroll down in the page, um, they also have um, kind of PowerPoint toolkits um, for reopening. Uh, for example, there's a hair salon and um, barbershop toolkit. That is a PDF um, that I'm putting in the chat box now if you wanna check that out. Um, it's like a what, 10 page or so kind of uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, talking about, um, of course, prevention practices, requirements around physical distancing, uh, infection control, so using um, disinfectant, um, protecting employees and those who come into your shop uh, or retail space, um, and then of course a variety of other resources and protocols um, that are helpful. So. Um, there's that LA County um, version, um, which um, I thought was really good. And then there's also a San Francisco County, and I'm sure there's a variety of other counties doing the same, but I just did some of the two largest ones. And I found the San Francisco one, which I just put a link in there um, to be particularly helpful because they had these um, Q and A tips and frequently asked questions for um, reopening um, in-store shopping or services. And for an example, um, I was checking out the retail version, which I'm just putting into the chat box that you can check out. I think it's very succinct in talking about all what the others have already done, um, but maybe um, in a different way um, and maybe brings up again issues um, that you weren't thinking about before. Um, and again, they give kind of the same resources, which everyone I think is recycling at this point. As again, I think um, there's, it's kind of a standard now that we're all kind of paying attention to that can be applied um, to any spot um, across the state or really um, the world at this place if of course the, the resources and protocols are there um, in place. So those were some of the, the key parts um, through my research. I'm trying to figure out um, what to convey would be most helpful. I, um, again, if um, the, the links are in the um, chat box and in the agenda um, and I can send it along after the meeting too um, and this record this conversation is being recorded too if you need to go back and look at it um, so I think that's that from me I think what I think would be very helpful um, which I did with a few others a couple months ago is learn about what you all are doing who actually have um, operations going either before now or in the future and something that we can all learn from each other um, as best practices. Those who are in this space, um, who are, are doing again day to day, um, that found have been useful. And as I see over the video, I see some of you are already at shops, you know, wearing face coverings and gloves and other things. So um, I see you're already at practice. So I just wanted to open it up to see if anybody had questions either about what I was sharing, the video, the documents, um, or if you want to share. Um, your own kind of personal experiences for others to learn, I think, again, would be most helpful. So I'll stop there for now, um, plug my computer in as it's dying. And uh, again, I'll just wait um, for some raised hands um, in the side, or you can physically raise your hand if I'm looking at the screen, either way, um, and that'd be great. And if there's no questions, I might be calling on some of you all who I know shared in the article with Cal Bike some of what you're doing. and. I think it'd be useful for others to hear on um, here um, if they didn't read that article um, as well. So I'll stop now, look for those hands, plug in my computer and um, see what comes up.
Great, I see you won. Danny, you wanna start us off? Yeah, why not? So I, I can share, like, just to give you an idea of what um, like big corporations are doing. On my day job, I work for Toyota in research and development. And every morning before we go to work, we have to fill out a questionnaire on your phone. And it asks you a whole bunch of questions. And they're the same questions that you would get asked if you walk into a, uh, your doctor's office. Like, do you have a temperature? Have you been around? Have you left uh, the area? It asks you a whole bunch of questions. And then once you fill those out, you walk into a triage area where there's a nurse who takes your temperature and then there's a little code that you get when you fill out this thing and you show her the code and then you're access, you're, you're allowed access into the facility. Um, but given that our community space was located inside a high school and how high schools are, they're, they're not going back, right? Not, not in, not in Long Beach Unified. Um, we've, we've lost our community space, uh, they're thinking about going back to a hybrid version in a couple of months, but it's unknown if they are going to allow um, other than teachers and students on campus. So for now, our community bike hub, which is located inside Jordan High School, is on hiatus. Um, and then our other projects are pop-up based. So we do pop-ups um, with cor corporate sponsors at uh, open street events and then also farmer's market type of pop-ups, those are no longer. So we technically have stopped and we are invited to participate in a bunch of events, but to be honest, um, our folks are young folks and I don't think it's, it's really different to, to, to go to a pop-up and put young fo folks and their families health at risk. So what we've decided collectively is to not do anything not go to any pop-ups, not put anybody's lives at risk for us to, um, to, to just to fix people's bikes, right? So that's, that's where I, I kind of wanted to ask y'all is how, how did y'all mitigate that risk? How did you, did y'all have that conversation with your volunteers, with your um, employees? Um, are y'all paying a hazard pay? Like I, I really wanted to learn, you know, those are the questions I had coming in here from, from y'all. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, I think those are the same questions I have as well. And I, again, I think it'd be useful um, to learn from each other on that. Um, I don't see anybody's hand raised. Does anybody um, want to go next? This is Sylvie with uh, Bike Stop Pueblo. We um, were, you know, closed for a couple months and then decided to open in the way that we felt was safe, which was that people could drop off a bike, we would have a volunteer mechanic fix it and they would come back at the end of the day and get it. So it totally changed the model of us being an educational space. Like usually we don't touch anyone's bike. They do all of that, but we didn't feel like it was gonna be possible to do that safely. But what we've done now and the decision to you know, reopen in some capacity was that you know, it was so difficult to like weigh the need of like especially like the, the communities that we serve. So we're focused in a neighborhood called, called City Heights, which has a really diverse community and a lot of folks who, you know, have suffered from major job loss and um, just the challenges that those folks faced because of like the results of COVID not having it, but you know, everything else that's gone on um, seem to outweigh the the, the risk a little bit, like giving these people an opportunity to like, you know, be able to get jobs again or get places like more easily, more, you know, safely and cheaply um, felt like that was more important in this community anyway. So what we've done now is um, we have a gated space and it's all outside. So we only operate outside and we tend to set up canopies to make like specific stations so that you can have kind of one-on-one -on -one attention with a mechanic, but like really limit how many people you interact with. And then we have a hand washing station and, you know, little like hand sanity stations kind of dotted about the space, but doing this outside, spacing out a whole lot um, and limiting how many people like come into contact with any one individual or a bicycle. And yeah, you know, you know, just changing the business model quite a bit. Um, and that's been effective. We still have way more people than we can possibly help 
in a given day, but the need uh, just keeps going up because people can't wait you know, weeks at a bike shop or afford to go to a bike shop these days. Definitely. Thank you, Sylvie, for you know, sharing your experiences there. Um, Zuli, I, I see you in the, in the chat um, can go next. Thank you for that. And then Poi, I see your hand raised, so you'll be after Zuli. Zuli, you want to go? Uh, thank you. Hello. Um, kind of similar to what Sylvie was kind of talking about, everything kind of being more uh, of an appointment basis. And then it's not so much doing it together anymore. It's kind of doing it for them. Um, but we've, uh, we're kind of really just kind of doing it for folks who really need transportation, um, that that is their only option. And so that's exactly why. And then Sylvie kind of touched up on that point as well, how like when we were kind of closed down for a little bit um, for the safety of ourselves and everybody, um, there was a real need. And folks like were just kind of waiting. And yeah, there's other bike shops that we would kind of guide them to that were still open and doing the whole drop off the bike in a safe um, setting, but they can't afford that. And so like that was completely out of their range, out of their league. So they're still kind of patiently waiting for us. And so what we decided is, and it's still experimental, kind of week by week, we kind of check in with each other um, just to see how everyone's feeling exposure wise and everything that we're doing, whether it be a bike uh, repair, a bike sale or bike or parts sales um, is all by appointment. And so we're writing it down in like a little agenda so that we're all kind of letting each other know, taking terms with who's going outside, who's kind of staying inside. Nobody's coming in the shop. So that's kind of like our safe space for ourselves and our volunteers. And then we've limited to like only five folks at a time in the shop, um, including like, cause we have an upstairs as well, but like that's including both cause of just the same space being shared. Um, and it's just consistently like getting feedback from everybody. It's a consistent conversation similar to how um, our other friends shared about like asking about the clinical, like, how are you feeling? Are you um, feeling any, fevers or anything. It's nothing like super set like a clinic style, but um, it is a conversation that we continuously have and we are adapting consistently. And so in that sense, we're being transparent with everybody that we're helping um, and telling them that we're, you know, trying to meet their needs, but also provide safety for ourselves so that we could continue uh, meeting those needs. And then so this week at, we actually also have like a little survey going on so that we could, um, get feedback from the customers that we are helping right now in terms of like maybe what we could improve on or what it is that's working, what's not working. So that maybe later on kind of how uh, Rachel was talking about in the beginning, how the reality is most likely we're not going to go back to before March. So therefore we're kind of trying to think of like, what is this new reality going to look like? How are we meeting um, folks needs that are still like capacitating folks to fix their bikes in this community space like mentality? Um, and yeah, that's, that's what I had to share. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think that was very useful. Um, Poi, I see your ran hand yeah. raised. Do you want to go next? Yeah. Um, I think our experience has been similar to Zuli's. Um, we have normally about 30 volunteers and, uh, we, we, we normally would open the, have the shop open in the evenings and the weekends, uh, to serve people when they're not, not working. Um, in response to the in response to the co era of COVID, uh, people like me have decided to socially distance to the degree that we don't even come to the shop anymore. But I would say about forty percent of our volunteers are so interested in serving the public, or so um, antsy, so I so um, fed up with the idleness that happens from just staying at home that they have been willing to to take a certain amount of risk and to run the shop. So, uh, you know, we, we uh, through negotiations and ideas and our, our regular monthly meeting where we work out our own, our policies, we determined that we could do about a third of our business. And our business is, is, uh, is most of our time and our effort is spent in teaching people to fix their bikes, which is really shoulder to shoulder effort. And uh, while that's a majority of our time, it only uh, it only um, uh, accounts for uh, less about a quarter of our income. Um, 
So we, we've cut back on that. We now have a line of people who are at the front door and they can come and, and one at a time uh, come to the front door and they can ask for a part. And in the shop, we limited the, the we have a 1700 square foot shop. Um, we limit it to a, a total of four volunteers in the shop and one will maintain the front door um, restrict people's access into the shop. We don't allow customers in the shop and the rest of the people will search for parts or will be working on what well, we get a good deal of business is bikes that have been donated to us which we then sell, fix up and sell as ready to go bikes. So that has been sustaining us at a, um, at a sustainable loss every month. But um, but it, it's provided us a, a, most of our income is selling of bikes that have been donated. Um, having said that, we, 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 ser we have uh, uh, traditionally served a lot of the um, socially marginal populations, homeless and such. And that has been a challenge for us because um, the desire to socially distance and follow the rules is a little bit harder for those communities to manage. Um, um, so anyway, uh, it's, uh, we're getting by um, and we're, uh, you know, we, we feel the loss of not being able to spend more time educating the public. Uh, the other thing that we've been doing is, um, that has been helping us financially is the, barks that, the bikes that are stripped down, we are searching for more of the specialty parts that we can sell for good money on eBay. And we've been using the eBay sales of rare and unusual parts or expensive parts as a way of, uh, of, uh, of getting those to flow through the business since we don't have people coming in and browsing uh, it at our cabinet, which has the finer quality parts. Um, so I think, I hope that that can be helpful to others who are running shops. Uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Poi. Yeah, I think that was, yeah, very comprehensive. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions for uh, Poi, Zuli, Danny, or anybody else? Or anybody else want to talk about what they're experiencing at their shop and how they go about it? Okay, so just really quick, the, the question that I have is for those that are fixing um, other people's bikes, do you guys carry the bike shop uh, liability insurance? Because the whole thing of getting around that for co-ops is we teach, we do not fix, but now y'all are fixing. And if somebody gets hurt with that bike that you fix, you are liable. Uh, at this point here, I want to say that we've argued about this quite a bit in our, ma in our management meetings and circles. And uh, officially we do not fix bikes. We, we do not, we do not charge for them. So, so, but it's been quite a controversy. It's been a, quite a controversy of people who feel like they want to give back and help, especially those people who are transportation poor. Uh, that, it's, it's a problem, but officially we are doing it. Uh, there may be those who are doing it uh, in a non-kosher way. Uh, we ask them to not, we ask them not to, and uh, with a wink, with a wink that we understand that they may be personally on their own doing something. I'm complete. Um, this is Diana from Biketopia in Berkeley. Um, we are not holding our workshops at the moment, but we have liability insurance for this reason, and we fix bikes at events, and so it's really important to us. I don't think it's that expensive for us. I don't know the exact amount, but it's definitely worth it. Um, it's just not something that we want to risk at all um, with the workshop. And I want to say that we're operating in a really similar way. We're having people drop off, drop off bicycles to get them fixed. But we um, just moved to a larger space that has different areas like within one space. And we're thinking about what well, we built a platform. And we're thinking about having like one person make, maybe make an appointment to have them come work on a bike and that being something that we test out. We're trying to acquire some fans to get airflow moving in there. But I think that, that it would be far enough from the volunteers that it would be okay. Um, and, you know, the volunteers could help support if people have questions. But that's something that we're thinking about piloting. Our, our other space is definitely way too small to even hold any sort of workshop educational 
thing right now, which has been really challenging for us because it's it's been um, hard to not do the core thing that we do. Um, but I wanted to mention that we do have liability insurance and that I, I recommend getting it if you can. Thank you, Diana. Um, anybody else have any questions? Uh, I see a hand raising. Aaron, you want to go ahead? ahead? Um, got a question about scheduling. How are you guys? Are you guys using some sort of program um, or is it just like call this number and let us know what time you want to be in or is it like a form that you have people fill out? Interested in that. Andrew, I see your hand raised. You want to respond to that? Yeah, um, we're using Square Appointments and it's a free application and it works great. And it's on mobile devices, on tablets and on computers. And so for everyone who needs to book an appointment with us, and that could be a bike donor, a volunteer to pick up a homework bike, is what we call them, or a customer who paid for a bike for curbside pickup, we just send them a link and then they book the appropriate slot. We have a 30 minute window for a homework bike volunteer. We have a 30 minute window for a someone who purchased a bike and a 10 minute window for someone just dropping off a donation. And that's been working great. I get text messages, they can change their app, or they can change their appointment and um, yeah, they can cancel and edit and they get text reminders too. So I definitely recommend that. that. We also use Square for our purchase system, and it has some integration um, capabilities as well. Thank you, Andrew. And I see, Steve, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I can tell you what, what we're using. We use um, a free service called Calendly. So it's like calendar, but instead of AR, it's LY. So Calendly. And you get one like appointment type for free and it connects to a Google Calendar or other services too, but we use it with Google Calendar. And so the nice thing about that is when someone books an appointment, that slot gets used up and someone else can't book that same slot. And they have other you know, niceties, like you can have like a cleanup, uh, you know, set up cleanup time. So if you wanna like have 15 minutes on either side of the appointment or that kind of stuff, it has different features. And it's working great for us. It's super low tech. Um, they have a little embeddable control you can just put right on your web page, and then people interact with that. And then you get an email, you know, a Google Calendar email notification, and you can communicate with them through email to follow up and give reminders and and that kind of stuff. It's actually been working really well for us as well. Thanks, Steve. Um, I see some. Um some stuff in the chat box. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Joey and Alvin. Appreciate it. Um, anybody else have anything? And also any questions for me that, I don't know, that I can take um, with the contacts I was mentioning earlier. Um, I don't know if there's any kind of questions around, yeah, health concerns or other things um, that folks um, have had need answers to that I could try to seek and uh, to find them. Um, definitely open to that. Um, so definitely ask away or send me an email. I'm also curious about if anybody on the call um, hasn't reopened or doesn't have an operation going, but would like to. And I would love to hear, you know, about some obstacles, whether it's just, you know, volunteers unable or something else. You know, I want to hear how we can be helpful and supportive too to, to getting where you were at. Anybody? Well, Jared, this is Rick from, from San Luis. Um, I, I don't want to actually, um, I can't address that um, one, but but just to give you a little recap. Um, one, this is great because our our little core group um, and Dan who's on, on, on the call and Gary, we try to have tried to maneuver through all this and, and you know, read as much stuff. So this discussion is, is very valuable pulling uh, the different perspectives because yeah you're right there's no guidance out there um I, i've read the retail i've read all i've read all those those booklets you know and and um a lot of the things that that the others um, shared I, I think we're we're doing some of those our space is probably smaller um than even some of those that and so um we're we're limiting access uh, in fact there's no i'll call it uh, educational uh, customers in our in our shop um, 
So one of the things that we, we do on the used um, parts, we keep derailers in a, in a milk block, milk crate and then, you know, and cassettes. And, and if somebody needs a, a, an essential part, we will actually carry it out to the curbside and let them go through uh, and look for that derailleur or, or you know, caliper or whatever they're, whatever they're, they're looking for so that we can get some people on the, on the road. We also do quite a bit of work um, related to donated bikes, rehabbing and then, and then selling them. But we also, because of the limitation of you know, the challenge of the supply and demand on, on uh, new, you know, from tubes to tires and things like that. Um, we have a lot of bikes that we call project bikes that uh, uh, they might need some loving care or a lot of care. And so we'll, we will let those go at a, at a, at a bargain price and they can take it home and, and if they're mechanically inclined to, you know, put new cables or brakes or whatever it, it, it needs. The, the liability issue that was raised is really interesting one. We do have um, pretty extensive liability, um, but the, the comment about being bike shop, I think I have that, I'm, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna check into that. The other thing is that I am curious about the instruction side. When, when and where is the guidance going to come related to social distancing instruction, whatever that means. Um, you know, I went to a, to a community bike shop in, in Colorado uh, a couple months ago, and they were doing it socially distanced outside. Um, you know, they weren't working on the show, but what, where's the instruction? And we need, um, because that, that is our bread and butter in serving our communities. And, uh, but it's, what's some of the future guidance on that? So, anyway, I, I, I appreciate all the, the feedback and, and, and thought. It's thought provoking. Um, and for, you know, Misery Loves Company or whatever, you know, pulling us together like this is, is very valuable for us to a group learn. Great. Thanks, Rick. I think, yeah, I was wondering that same question about, yeah, when is instruction or, you know, actual side to side, which you all do, you know, most importantly with others, when is, when is that going to happen again? And yeah, I, I, I don't know. And I don't know if others have any thoughts around that or experienced or seen other people to do that safely. And it seems like a very difficult thing at this time, right in the, the middle of the pandemic, but any thoughts on that? or anything else. We only have two minutes left, so I want to save at least uh, 30 seconds for some final words. Um, but any thoughts, Peter? Um, well, I don't think, well, I used to think it, we have to be either 100% safe or not do it at all, but I've come around that, you know, you got to do everything you can to kind of reduce the chance of spreading, you know, germs, basically, and just do your best and kind of make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, so, if, the bicycle kitchen, we are like installing a roof fan that's gonna suck the air out. But at the same time, we're lucky to have a pretty big yard space. So everything, all operations are outside only. Uh, only one person's allowed inside. Um, but something um, totally different is, we also have a weekly online shift where we do this Zoom. Um, and it's been kind of interesting, like people would really like show their bicycle with their video and, you know, we would tell them to yeah, move your camera this way or that way, get closer. And we would kind of like discuss what might be the problem or what might be the solution. And it turns into like just talking about, you know, what's your favorite bike is and it's kind of fun. But at the same time, sometimes we have only one person. It's, it's kind of erratic, but, but it is kind of doable to do things online. At the same time, it's not the same thing. It's, as um, as Pauline mentioned, you know, there's this urge to just wrench together and you know, it's really hard to get around that. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Peter. Um, I saw in the chat box, Daniel, you put um, uh, your sanitizing protocol. I think, yeah, I had a question about that and I'm glad you put that in there. So thanks for doing that. And yeah, I am curious as well as like if we're, you know, being 100% safe about masks and protocol and everything else. Um, yeah, when would be the point to do, you know, side by side instruction and other things. And um, 
I'm not an expert. I can only guess and along with the rest of us, I guess, but um, uh, I could end, end there. Is there any last burning questions, comments before I kind of wrap up and point you all to the form that Dave put in the chat box? Um, any last concerns, feedback, comments? I see a hand. Gary, go ahead. I did not know how to use a chat box properly, but one of the things that will come up uh, eventually through any of the uh, uh, private or public education institutions doing tech ed and shop classes, they were going to, they will have to come up with a protocol, I think, in some fashion to be able to teach their welding program, their wood program, their drafting program, things of this nature where interactions with students are going to be very important. I don't know what that looks like yet, but they may be inventing the wheel just now that we as uh, educators also can use uh, their program or modify their programs. No doubt they'll be state approved or they'll be educational institution approved um, that may save us some legwork. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Gary. Um, I promise we would all end on time and we're only going to be a minute or two late. So I'm sorry for that. But um, thank you everyone for joining um, for your patience and setting this up and sitting through a two hour zoom call. I know we're already on this enough. So I appreciate you being here, sharing your knowledge, your experiences. Um, I just want to do a couple things. Um, one is um, Dave put a link. Uh, in the chat box for a survey to provide feedback for this two hour conversation. It'd be great to get some feedback, so feel free to fill that out if you can. Um, secondly, um, again, I'm, I'm good to be contacted with questions, resources, or anything that you have in mind or want to convey to the larger group here or others who weren't able to join. I know doing it in the middle of the day is hard for folks who have daytime jobs. Um, and are busy. So this is being recorded. So I'll be sending this around to everyone um, broadly and probably link it up to um, a couple Calbyte emails and other things if you're on that thread. So um, feel free to check out the recording and probably some summarizing notes that I'll provide. Um, and um, again, I'm, yeah, feel free to follow up with me, with Lori, um, or with each other. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that I truly enjoy connecting different folks, um, different parts of the state around similar and shared interests. So um, I look forward to future conversations among you all, either on this topic or others that we can tackle um, at a statewide level. I think Cal Bike is uniquely situated to be a coordinating and convening force for that if there's interest um, for things to talk about um, or listservs or whatever. So I just want to put that out there and if anybody has any interest, you know, bring it up with me, with Dave or others. Um, if you think this could be a helpful space, because I'm, I'm definitely love the community bike shop space, the bike kitchens, and all of you doing that work. So again, I appreciate it. Sorry for running a little bit over time. Um, and I'll end there. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, I'll talk to you all later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Jared. Thank you.